Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Mullen, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Assessing Your Collection by Quality and ROI, sponsored by ProQuest and featuring Ann Doherty of Resources for College Libraries, Michelle Ducoto, and Mark Tullis of ProQuest. Today's webinar is one in a new series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. What's distinctive about this series is the audience. This is the first series of its kind directed toward the nearly 12,000 ACRL members and 15,000 choice users and fans that collectively comprise perhaps the single largest and most important audience in academic librarianship today. Important issues and products deserve lively, candid, and informed discussion, and this is something we believe this new program and audience will deliver. It's a program that offers something for everyone. For librarians, it offers an opportunity to learn about and discuss new ideas, issues, and products. For sponsors, it offers an opportunity to receive unfiltered and direct feedback from the most knowledgeable audience in the academic library community. And for the academic library community, it offers another forum for addressing common solutions to common problems and taking advantage of common opportunities. Here at Choice, we're happy to be working with our ACRL colleagues to bring thought-provoking, high-quality content to the world of academic libraries and look forward to today's program. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will also see a Q&A panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We will spend some time responding to your questions during the program, so please feel free to submit these throughout. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel for today. Ann Doherty is Project Editor for Resources for College Libraries. She manages the 70-plus RCL and RCL Career Resources Subject Editors and oversees the ongoing editorial development of the database, including content updates, editorial policies and procedures, and regular peer review. Before joining Choice in 2008, Ann was a reference and instruction librarian at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Michelle Dakota is Senior Product Manager for ProQuest. She has more than 15 years of experience leading cross-functional teams to deliver software, hardware, and service products in the intellectual property development and technology product space. Michelle is integral to helping define the vision and product requirements for serials solutions in TOTA and the overall go-to-market plan. Mark Tullis is Director of Product Management for ProQuest. He's the Product Manager for Intota Assessment and also oversees the resources for college libraries, books in print, and synthetic solutions product lines from ProQuest. Mark has an MLIS from LSU and before joining ProQuest, managed product lines at Elsevier, OCLC, and Register.com. And now I'd like to get us started by turning things over to Ann Doherty. Thanks, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ann Doherty. As Laura said, I'm the project editor of Resources for College Libraries, a publication that is produced in partnership between Choice out of the ACRL and Bowker and ProQuest. Today I'm going to introduce you to the Resources for College Libraries bibliography, discuss how libraries can use RCL as a qualitative benchmark for collection assessment, and highlight a few of the database features. If you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat space 
and I'll try to address them at the end of the webinar. You can also feel free to email me. And Justin, can you please put up the poll question? Should be seen on your screens a poll question. And we're just kind of curious. How many of you have ever used the following for collection development or analysis? I'm guessing if you're on this attending this webinar, it's because you are either looking at doing collection assessment or have done it or in the middle of doing it. Resources for college libraries, online or in print. Books for college libraries. BCL3, the third edition, was published in 1988. Both RCL and BCL3 or neither RCL or BCL3. And we'll keep this poll question up for a few slides as I, as I introduce the RCL content and editorial development. RCL is, uh, provides a recommended core list of print and electronic titles for all academic libraries. Resources for College Libraries provides 61 subjects that are aligned with the undergraduate college curriculum. And Resources for College Libraries Career Resources offers 56 subjects across 10 major career clusters. This is areas like allied health, graphic arts, criminal justice. Combined, RCL and CR are available as RCL+. Plus. This offers over 85,000 titles across 117 different subject headings. And these headings are really aimed at the majors and minors that you're going to see at the undergraduate level. So RCL, what's different from RCL from BCL3 is that it now includes interdisciplinary and area studies. So it's covering GLBT studies, American studies, and you're getting vocational resources covered in the career resources product. So who's putting this editorial content together? Well, as I said, RCL is independently managed, and the editorial content is being produced out of choice in the ACRL. There's a team of over 70 subject editors who are primarily academic faculty and librarians. And what these subject editor experts do is maintain content on a continual basis. So you know, in the old days, you had a print volume of BCL3, and you looked at it, and in two years when new publications came out, it was, it was still that core list, but it had already gotten a little bit old. And now the database is continuously updated. And the editors add new core titles on a regular basis, weed obsolete titles, select web resources to add, and they also update and maintain unique RCL subject taxonomies. This content also undergoes comprehensive peer review on a regular basis. And to date, over 500 librarians and faculty members have contributed to RCL either as subject editors, bibliographers, or peer reviewers. So you know that you're getting content that's been vetted and that's being assessed on an ongoing basis to ensure that the quality titles are actually core to the undergraduate curriculum. And RCL also comes from a rich publication history. It's a successor to Books for College Libraries, which was published in 1988. And the history of RCL goes back all the way to 1931, when Charles Bunsen Shaw and ALA published the list of books for college libraries, which I'm guessing no one here attending the webinar today was around for, but is still a rich, um, a rich landmark to remember. So let's go back to that, that poll question and take a look. And actually, looks like the majority, there is kind of split. The majority of you have neither used RCL or BCL3, but a number of you have used um, both of the tools or RCL. So thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, it's kind of interesting to see as we, as we move along what you've used. So let's look now at some of the collection challenges that you're facing. I'm guessing at least one, if not all of these, are things that you're dealing with in your libraries today. As you try to manage your collections, print, both print and electronic, budget constraints. It, you know, it's not an anniversary that we liked celebrating, but it was the, the five-year anniversary of the start of the recession. And I know that's had a tremendous impact on academic libraries and your collection budgets. Demands for space as you 
integrate learning commons or um, vie for classroom space in libraries. Diverse user needs. You know as academic librarians that what, an, what a new freshman needs as far as resources and tools is very different from what a new faculty member needs, is very different from what an emeritus faculty member needs and is going to use when they're, when they're um, accessing library resources. Changing technology. I was kind of amused today. I was reading a blog um, out of the Harvard Business Review, and, and a researcher was calling Twitter old media already. And the, the media and the technology is changing incredibly rapidly. And librarians are really, um, a lot of times, the gatekeepers for trying to stay on top of that and help both students and faculty um, stay abreast of changing technology. And finally, we're seeing an increasing demand to prove the value of the library to administrators. And assessment is, of course, um, a key way that libraries can show what the collections are doing, what the library collection is doing to support the curriculum and to support the needs of students uh, and researchers on campus. So in the midst of this really rapidly shifting landscape for academic libraries, what, what we want to try to, to tell you today is the message that quality does count and that RCL can be a bit of a life preserver when you are in the midst of a collection assessment project and you're taking in multiple different um, input factors. When you're, when you're looking at assessing your collection, you might be looking at um, search stats. You might be looking at faculty input. Um, you might be looking at um, um, you know just just basics of okay how much how how much room do I need to get you know how much space does this book take up on the shelf do I keep the book that has a one inch spine or do I keep the book that has a five inch spine um, because it does matter when you have when you're looking at um, the shifting needs of your collection and your in the physical space in your library so what R what RCL can provide is that qualitative benchmark it's librarian vetted. So you know that the titles that are included in RCL are those that subject experts have selected and that subject experts have reviewed on an ongoing basis. It's offering breadth and depth. So if you get a faculty input, that's great. But a, a faculty member in political science might be able to tell you an awful lot about what Congress titles you should include, but nothing about what political theory or international relations or comparative politics you want to have in your collection. So what RCL can provide is that breadth as well as the depth that you get from having a balanced core collection. It's also giving you new and classic titles. Editors are selecting and adding publications that have been published in the last six months on a regular basis, but they're also ensuring that the core titles that may have been published as many as 50 years ago that belong in the collection still are maintained in the collection. It's giving you titles that are both durable and timely. So we're watching publication trends and making sure that you know, if there's a, a number of publications that are coming out on, say, terrorism, those might be included but also that they're going to be durable. So not every title that's being published on terrorism necessarily belongs as an essential title in an undergraduate collection. And subject editors are, make, are assessing that decision along the way when they're looking at what makes an RCL title, what makes a core title. RCL also benefits from its, pub, from its partnership with Choice and that the RCL database offers choice reviews for in content that's included. And finally, we think that RCL provides a good complement to patron-driven or demand-driven acquisition programs that are near ubiquitous now. So while you're providing just in time or just before the term paper is due opportunities for students to get content, RCL provides that durable and um, qualitative tool for knowing that you're also providing students and faculty with 
a balanced collection that's going to meet their needs a year from now, five years from now, and you know, who knows what it will look like, but possibly 10 years from now. I want to take a few minutes to just show you um, briefly a couple of the database features that RCL provides. And what you see now is a screenshot from the Resources for College Libraries homepage. And I want to take just a minute to, to emphasize that RCL is produced in partnership with Choice and ACRL. And we manage the editorial development independently, but we maintain, we maintain it in part with the bibliographic data that's coming from books and print, as well as the technological trends and strengths of ProQuest. So I think you're really getting the best of both worlds because you get that quality and authoritative content that you trust coming from choice. And you get um, really the on, on top of the trend technology that you're going to trust from ProQuest and Velcro. This will look at the browse feature in RCL. I think what's nice about this that I'd like to point out is, is the fact that you can look and explore the specific RCL subject taxonomies. These have been created by the subject editors, and they're intended to be aligned with the undergraduate curriculum. And I find this to be incredibly helpful if you're looking at either doing collection development in a subject area that you might not be familiar with, or if you're on a reference desk, and maybe you're a humanities librarian, and you know, it's Sunday afternoon and a business student comes up and asks you a question about marketing. You can look at the business, um, the business taxonomy and help orient yourself to those titles that belong um, and that are most appropriate for business students. We're responsible for looking at based on um, based on LC ranges. This next slide gives you a look at the RCL advanced search page, and I just want to briefly point out a couple of the features here. You can search the database by content that's been reviewed in choice, as well as searching by whether a title in RCL has also been identified as a choice outstanding academic title which I think is a great feature. You can, again, filter by LC class when you're doing a search. And you can also search by RCL audience level. So if you just want to find those materials that are most appropriate for lower level undergraduates, you just want to find those materials that are going to be useful, useful for a faculty member who's preparing a new course, um, you can easily and quickly identify those titles. And then I want to show you just a little bit of the, the RCL item record. What's nice here, again, is that you're getting the bibliographic data that's coming from books in print. So it's up to date. And as soon as the title goes out of print, you're going to know that it's out of print. Um, but you also get really nice features like being able to find whether an ebook is available. If you have a selection policy that says you're going to be buying electronic over print every time, there you go. RCL will tell you if it's available. Off the item record, option to purchase titles directly, and to find a few catalogs. I'm looking at using RCL for collection assessment. What RCL collection? benchmark analysis and also an opportunity to know that RCL is peer review programs to integrate and train other libraries on the work. In summary, I hope that what you've, what you've seen today so far is how RCL can provide that 
qualitative component for collection assessment. It's also available through additional tools, including the Bookwire mobile app, RCL eBook collections via eBrary, and Intota assessment. Thanks for your time today. Please feel free to email me if you have questions about the editorial content in RCL. And now I'm going to turn things over to Michelle Dakota, Senior Product Manager at ProQuest. Thanks, Anne. Good morning to everyone on the West Coast. Good afternoon to everyone elsewhere. We're excited to talk to you today about Intota Assessment, Evidence-Based Collection Assessment. The nature of library collections has fundamentally changed. Content spend has shifted from primarily print to primarily electronic. We are hearing, in fact, that some libraries spend over 90% of their current collection budget on electronic content. And some modern libraries are reporting upwards of 93% budget spent on electronic materials. In addition to changing in content spend, today's users are also changing. The modern user accesses the library remotely from a device, a laptop, tablet, or smartphone, and expects a single search box and click-through experience. In conversation with libraries, we've heard about the pain with library systems. This pain can be binned into three main areas. The first is workflows. Workflows to handle print and electronic content are often managed by different groups in the library, often using different tools, and typically including some sort of spreadsheet or even a clipboard. System maintenance is also a painful area. Libraries report issues with locally deployed systems that require maintenance, staff, and time. And finally, assessment. Collections assessment is challenging in this current electronic world. We've heard reports of, if performed at all, collection assessment is often manual. It lacks qualitative rigor and fails to be comprehensive. Typically, assessment is performed for either the print area of the collection or the electronic area. Intota Assessment offers collection assessment capabilities for both monographs and serials in both electronic and print formats. It includes quantitative as well as qualitative analysis. It includes your library data plus some of our unique assets including our knowledge base, allowing you to showcase the library's value, calculate return on investment, and simplify collection management. This quick view shows you some of the data incorporated in Intota Assessment. If you take a look at the top row, you see the data that we ingest from the library. So we're pulling in the print catalog, we're pulling in circulation data, as well as your electronic holdings information, and interlibrary loan requests. On the second row, you see the assets that ProQuest brings to the analysis, including our rich hosted and maintained knowledge base, Ulrich's comprehensive serials information, data from books in print, the summon service, in the future, leveraging the Summon Index and analytics from Summon, citation weighting for users of RefWorks, access to the Hathi Trust, book sales data, and resources for college libraries, which you just heard described by Anne. All of this together enables views of data that have been previously difficult to obtain, views of usage, recommendations around acquisition or deselection, and reporting and dashboards. I'll hand it off to Mark Tullis, Director of Product Management, who can move into a live demonstration. Uh, 
Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining today. And thank you, Michelle, for the slides and the overview of Intoda assessment. And to uh, Ann Dougherty for the great overview on, on discussion of RCL, which you know we'll demonstrate part of that during the uh, demonstration today. So uh, what you're looking at now is our nearly complete Intoda assessment system. And uh, where we enter the system, of course, is right into our cost per use. And before I go into um, what, we, uh, what we have behind the, the navigation here, I just want to walk you through a few of the different charts and graphs that we have presented uh, based upon library data that's been brought in from the, um, the library ILS, so the library management system. So in the first four here, you'll see, you can see that you can look at top 10 publishers by expenditure, which you can also turn into a table. Same for the top 10 publishers by circulation, which you can view as uh, a bar chart or look at it as a top chart. And down here at the bottom, the top 10 subjects by expenditure. What we hope to do with many of the charts and graphs that we build in Intoda Assessment is gives you a visual idea of the usage of your, surf, your, your collection particularly on the book side and the electronic side um, over time, whether it's a month, a quarter, a year, a couple of years, and, and certainly generate interest to come back in more frequently. Let's look at the navigation of the entire site, and we'll drill into select reports. So we've broken up really the task areas of Intoda assessment by cost per use, which as you can see here represents book, database, and journal, print electronic, Usage, similarly book, database, and journal, print and electronic. Accreditation, which we've begun to build out a handful of new reports that are based on ACRL and SCONAL, but are going to be adding more, and we'll look at a couple of those. Recommendations, this uh, really dovetails nicely into both what you heard from Anne and Michelle, and we'll look at some charts. We'll look at forthcoming title information from books and print and a comparison to resources of college libraries, RCL. On deselection, also known as weeding, we'll look at print deselection and its sister report, ebook deselection. Uh, we're including overlap analysis, and then we have peer analysis. And peer analysis is interesting in that we will allow users of Intoda assessment to look at their collection from a subject level across other users of Intoda assessment. So whether it's at the uh, title level, you know, for books, databases, or journals. So we'll look at the title report uh, before we close out the presentation today for questions. So first I'll go into cost per use, and we'll look uh, beyond the charts and graphs into some of the data. First report that I'll spin out is called cost by publisher. And as you'll see in most reports, um, we have a horizontal filtering and date manipulation area where you can choose your month and year or the date range. For most of our demo today, I'll do a simple year. And what this does, it'll come back and look at uh, publishers, the expenditure for the year, the usage for the year, and derive a cost per use. If you want to look a little deeper at the actual titles that represents one of these lines, you can click through and see what's behind that publisher. Uh, most columns in Intoda assessment are sortable, and you'll note here as I'm highlighting over the ISBN there or by the publisher. And one other thing to note is that when you're um, taking large data sets out of the system, perhaps you want to manipulate the data more in Excel or you want to join it with other data from your university or library, you can always click export and go to a variety of formats for export. Similar to our cost by publisher report is our cost by subject. We'll do a quick demo of that. This is one of the reports where we let you toggle between Library of Congress and Dewey. We'll support the both of those uh, when we go live, and we'll be looking at other subject usage 
uh, subject classifications like mesh going forward. In this particular report, you can see that you've got everything broken out by uh, subject and going down in descending order. You want to drill into the subject classifications and go down one or two levels to be able to do that. And like in the previous report, you can click on a number and go right into the actual titles themselves. Next, I'll go into our print book cost per use. And what this will do for a year range is allow you to drill into uh, your, your list of titles and identify trends of usage. You can, if you like, refine this down to particular subject classifications. Format, you can filter by ISBNs. And if you only wanted to look at particular collections, uh, we have some loaded here just as a sample. So if I wanted to only look at maybe my stacks or those in reserve or to you know, exclude some, which uh, might be of a value, you can do that as well. We'll look at the full list here. So as you're seeing here, title by title, we're showing you uh, uh, matched authority data coming from books and print. So on the author and the title, the classification scheme, the subject, ISBN. Uh, the cost can be provided by the library through their acquisitions file data, or from books and print, or both. So in what you're looking at here are examples of where um, both could come into play. Whereas your MSRP could be coming in from books and print and could be a, a good backup in case you do not have our acquisitions data going back maybe past a particular date. You have a gift item and maybe the uh, cost is unknown. So um, it's also very valuable too if you're doing a um, you know, a project to understand uh, disaster recovery. If you needed to get cost information of what it would cost today to replace items, as long as the title comes in and matches to the, the more than 20 million records in books and print, we can match that data back for you and also match it to the authority data as you see here. Additionally, we're looking at the quantity and the usage, cost, cost for use, and where it's located in your collection. Feedback we've gotten so far from some librarians is that due to the age of their system or the reporting package that they might have, for some this is the first time that they could drill into data in this way. We're going to look at database cost per use and give you an example of one of our counter reports. So anyone that's uh, worked with zero solutions before and has used the 360 counter service um, has had a wealth of reports available at their fingertips as well as dashboards and charts and graphs and things to help them uh, really manage the return on investment for any electronic database. What we're doing in Intoto Assessment within ProQuest is actually rebuilding many of those reports as well as some new ones so that um, any 360 counter user that might want to upgrade for, to Intoto assessment uh, can do so and still have the same uh, great reporting that they've had before in 360 counter. In this example here, the database cost per use is generated from the DB1 and DB2 reports and includes cost per use when the title price is available. So um, for users of um, the serial solutions now that have included their cost information into the client center, that can be brought overnight into Intoto assessment as changes are made, and we can help derive you know, the cost for use for any report. I'll go into one of our journal reports. So for this particular cost for use report, we're also we're going to see the e-journals broken out by subject classification. And here's an example of how they can be broken out. So if you look at the level one subject here on the, uh, the very left here, these are all the journals that this particular sample library has uh, within that classification. You can do sorting and rearrange the list as you like. You, you have the additional information of the authority ISSNs, 
publisher, provider, and the 2012 use decision cost for use. If you want to benchmark this and include more years, you just add those years into some of the different, in, into the year range, and you can see more, the, more year over year changes. We'll go into our usage area. As you can see here, we have dozens of reports here, some of them based on some of the new information we're deriving from the print collection from the ILS, as well as many usage reports that counter users are already used to based on the standard. I'll quickly go into one of our top charts. So this one can tell you top print and top ebook titles. And I think believe the setting here I have right now is about two years. So really over two years, these are some of the top used titles both in print and E. And as we've been building out the product, we've been working with six development partners who have been giving us ideas on you know, what should be some default charts and graphs that would really entice users. And we're taking their lead in building those out. So there'll be, still be some more that'll come out and we'll work on a way to provide a, cost, a custom, um, custom widget builder as well later on. So going deeper into the usage area, We'll look at the circulation report, which is really our checkouts by year. So this is a blend of two different views. The default view is going to let you look at a range of years between 28 and 2012 and look at of your usage over several subject classifications. The top part of this is where you can look at a particular year and look at the titles themselves. But what will be interesting is, is once I affect this report, the default here will change, and you can see trend lines based on your particular year. And I'll show you another trick what you can do to um, reduce some of the, uh, and, and I go right into particular subject areas. So we'll do total usage and descending. I'll hit apply. So the listing here, we'll look at a title level, publisher, um, the ISBN is a format, the publication date. If we have cost, we can derive a cost for use, but then really this is more of the usage report. So for 2012, for this particular title, you've got 23 uses over 2012. If I scroll down, I can look at the 2012 um, quarterly view of this title list. And then if I want to break it down a little more granularly, I can pick a couple of subjects, hit apply and really hone in to these particular subjects and see how usage changes quarterly for quarterly. Our next usage report based on the print side, we call circulation dynamics. And this is gonna give you a really interesting view into usage for particular titles and subject areas. So it's going to ask me to uh, select my subject type first. Okay, so when this comes back, and I'll really take you column by column of what we're, what we're showing here. This is looking, of course, at holdings and also looking at <clears throat> uh, the usage information brought in from <clears throat> the circulation system, circulation files rather. So at the title level, you can see author and publisher, LC class, and you can swap that to Dewey, of course. And this is a match to books and print, as I mentioned before. You can see your format, publication date, when it was added to your collection, the first time that something was used, check, checked out, the months until it was used. So in this case, it was three months after purchase. In this case down here, four rows down, it was 10 months. Last use, the month since the last use, and the months elapsed in general, the total use, and where it's located in the collection. So for a much larger library, uh, like an ARL, you may have multiple locations, and you know this may be broke. The collection could be broken out by your medical, your law, your um, your chemistry collection, your main collection, your undergraduate collection. You know this could be really granular based upon what the library has provided in, in their um, extract. So uh, this is a really interesting view. You can slice and dice this data in many different ways, maybe by subject or LC class, to really look at when I'm buying titles, you know, how often do they get used and when do they first get used? 
And this is a, a great way to look at your buying patterns and usage patterns together. We'll take a quick look at ebook usage. And this is a replication of one of our counter reports that we've had in 360 counter. We'll do a year. Great. So what's coming back is uh, what's generated from BR1 and BR2 reports for the specified time period. And you can see it broken out by title, provider, the report type code, BR1, BR2, the ISBN and the usages, as well as grand totals. I'm going to shift gears from our usage area. Um, you can tell we have a great deal of reports there. And if we have time, we're going to come back and see a couple more. But I do want to get to some of the other ones. And um, we'll go into accreditation briefly. So anyone that's had to answer an ACRL survey, and I have a feeling that most people on the call have at some point, it can take a lot of time, as well as other accreditation agencies. What we've done is try to hone in on those questions we can answer and provide you back that said report so that you can add those totals or answer those questions. So I'm going to look at a year here, again, full year. Hit apply. I believe the report that's generating now is going to come back on uh, full text database usage and allow you to easily go ahead and answer those questions. Uh, some things that we're still working on, of course, for ACRL could be, you know, your complete title list or maybe how you break it out between print and electronic. That can take a lot of work getting out of uh, any of your systems, particularly your, your ILS. You know, something as we have that information ingested, have those totals and have those title lists, we can feed back to you and help answer those questions. So something to look forward to when we have to release, re release this fall. This will take a little longer today. <clears throat> But we've been getting a lot of requests from libraries that whether they're an ARL, if they're an international group, um, if they want to answer specific subject areas like chemistry, American Chemical Society, and others, you know, can we start to um, aggregate some of those accreditation bodies questions? And if we have the collection information stored, you know, feed it back and list any caveats that might apply. So in this case here, you know, this is generated from the JR ones, and it's giving you a number of successful full text articles. And as this kind of really leads into where we were talking earlier, uh, where, where Ann Dower was talking earlier about RCL, and what this is doing is comparing your collection to RCL and telling you how it breaks out. So for criminal justice, um, I have 30% of what's recommended for the core. In law, I have 25%, and then it goes downwards. But if I want to see this in a more granular view, I go to the compare to RCL. And this is where I can compare to either RCL or CR. And CR, as you may have heard earlier, is what is used in two colleges. I want to see my results based on Library of Congress. And descending sort is fine. So it's coming back. And again, if you can remember the top chart that was shown, I had um, you know, law as being one of my best represented versus the core system. But you, know, you can really drill in and see, OK, here are the, set, the titles that aren't held the titles that are not held, which are recommendations of a sense. The core titles, so that's really the total number that the editors of RCL have added to their system, and then a percent in the library. If I need to drill in and see what these recommendations are, I click there, and my list will come back. Actually, we're running a little low on time. I'm going to go ahead and jump to our, our DC. Oh, here we go. So um, we're, as we're, what, what this is looking at, again, is a list of titles. And it'll tell you the author, the publisher, the classification, the ISBN, the price, published year. 
uh, whether something is held by RCL, ebook status, uh, and award and review. So this is a typical list of, um, of titles that's represented throughout the site. So let's go into our deselection area and we'll look at the print deselection reports. So what this is letting me do is look at usage back to a particular time. So whatever usage I have loaded is really what I could display here and go back that far. And the next thing I can choose is my subject classification. So I've chosen LC and now it's populated. Do you want to break this down by particular subjects? Let me just choose agriculture. What it also lets me do is to uh, decide whether or not I want to look at usage below a certain threshold. So I could go all the way down to zero at something um, that's uh, less than or equal to 10. I can go to a collection level like stacks, so I don't include reference or archives or anything like that. And I'll click apply. Let me just hit descending so we have a little more of a dramatic report for us. And there are all the filters I can apply to, or I can come back and um, reset my list. So in this very powerful report, we call this multi-source weeding. So in addition to the title, the author, the publisher, and the class, classifications, your cost is coming from books and print, format, the publication date, whether or not an ebook is available currently on the market. So if you have something that's maybe of high use or low use, if you do need to keep the, get the ebook, here's, um, we can let you know that it is on the market. Uh, the status of a title, whether it's in print or out of print, sometimes an indicator of uh, value. Uh, whether something has an award, so this can be pulled from books in print, and it's a long list of awards that are uh, included. Whether something has a book review, so the book reviews certainly on the academic spectrum include uh, choice reviews, as well as Library Journal and Publishers Weekly. Uh, those are aggregated from books in print, and they're shown here as an aggregate, but you can you know, go into books in print to see the specifics if you need to. Whether or not it's held by RCL, so a great use of this report is you could filter out titles that are held by RCL so that you never see them and you, you don't deselect titles that are considered part of a core collection. Those are the ones you really do want to keep. So the last use, which is often you know, very valuable in uh, weeding projects, the total usages, as well as the location. So we're getting a lot of requests, as you can imagine, from librarians who want to add more fields, and we'll be adding more fields as we uh, go to market. We're going to go to peer analysis quickly and do run one simple report. And I know we've got a lot of questions here we want to get to and allow for some time there. So as I mentioned earlier, the, in peer analysis, you can compare yourself to any library within Intoda assessment. To do analysis, or you can look at all. And I can have a choices of showing all, showing unique, or showing title overlap. So um, for this analysis here, it's showing me against um, one of our development partners, Ball State. And it's telling me where we have overlap. And I can expand this list to go much larger. Okay, what I think we should do now is go back and um, take some questions. We've gone through a great deal of the app. I could do this for another hour. We have that many reports, and I'd probably put most of you to sleep. So I think we should go ahead and, and um, transition back to our um, to the uh, folks at ACRL. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand back over. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, at this time, our panelists take your questions. I have a lot in the queue right now. And so um, as I go through those, feel free to use your Q&A feature um, to submit additional questions. I know Anne has been answering some of your questions for RCL, um, but there seems to be a quite a bit about um, in total assessment. So let me just launch into that. Um, Michelle, can you tell us um, a little bit about uh, the launch of Intota Assessment, and do you have to have um, uh, be part a customer? Do you have to be a customer of Serial Solutions to actually get Intota Assessment? Great, thanks for the question. Intota is our new library services platform, 
And we are offering this as a service-based platform, so our first service of Intoda is Intoda Assessment. It will launch commercially in the fourth quarter of this year, and it is available to customers. So you would need to purchase a subscription to the product, and then um, all of this great analysis would be available to you as a customer of Serial Solutions, which is a business unit of ProQuest. Great. And to follow up on that, is um, are the, could you talk about any ILS systems that are compatible with um, Intoda? And is it, um, is it expected to be able to work with most ILSs? So what we're working on is qualifying each of the widely used ILS systems. And we're really starting with a, a US-based approach. So we have worked with, as Mark mentioned, six development partners. They have different ILS that they're using in the library, and we are working today on ingesting data from several of those systems. We expect to have qualification of uh, most ILSs uh, broadly available in the US, um, so those in including uh, III, those offered by Ex Libris, um, and others, as well as Circe Dynex. And then we'll work uh, in a one-by-one -one fashion qualifying other ILS systems. The library would be given from us the fields that we need to ingest, and then the library prepares the extraction. And the library makes that data available to us for ingestion. Great. And Mark, there's a lot of questions are coming in. If you could talk about what happens to RCL and BBAS, and do you have to have a subscription to Books and Print in order to get into the assessment, and that whole relationship? Great questions. So uh, when you buy into the assessment, you are getting benefits throughout you know, the ProQuest family. So you know, to begin with, you're going to have um, you know being able to do overlap analysis and see the metadata and the core collection availability from books and print and RCL. So that part is included. What you're not going to have is a discovery and search and discovery view of books and print or RCL. So if you need to use those resources for collection development, um, you can you know, go to those and search and uh, build title list and use them in the same way you have before. So really it's looking at you know, your, your analysis and reporting on this side, leveraging that metadata. You know, we'll also begin to leverage metadata from the knowledge base and, and uh, Oryx as well. So, but it all goes back to, you know, if you need to do discovery, you should use those, those products. And if you need to do analysis, you can use this product. The, you know, you're not required to have books and print or RCL or Oryx to see that data populate within this system. What you'll need to do is, is, uh, is probably some people are asking, you know, you'll uh, want to um, include your counter reports, you know, you'll want all your counter data, your ILS data, including your mark records and your, and your uh, usage and your acquisitions. And really that's going to be the, the, ben, the uh, building, blo building blocks, rather, of um, seeing the, these reports come to action. That's great. Um, and then let's get back into some of the uh, functions of Intoda. Um, Mark, can you um, sort um, by LC class in the in the report field? Yes, you are able to sort by uh, the subject classification. So if you choose li Library of Congress or Dewey, you can uh, do sorting so that you can see titles grouped together based on that. And then regarding the accreditation reports, do the sources um, from which the reports are generated all have um, to follow the counter uh, code? So the sources, do they need to follow the counter code? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. What we're, what the, really the approach we're, t we're taking now is, is looking at those surveys, you know, year over year, looking at the different ones that we want to include and going to those specific questions and saying, okay, can we, can, one, can we answer it? Is it as simple as, you know, sh uh, tell me the total number of volumes and then break it out by print or electronic or show me the usage from uh, databases? Um, I think the library may or may not have the capability in some cases to have counter statistics on some, and, you know, sometimes you can create them based on the reporting coming from a vendor 
and kind of you know um, um, uh, get by. Um, so there could be cases where you may not be able to report in that fashion to answer a question based on what the vendor provides you. But if it does come in a counter compliant way, I believe it makes it easier to answer some of those questions, but they do vary from accreditation agency to agency. So that's the best we know right now. And you know, as we work in some more complex ones, um, we may not be able to tackle everything of boil the ocean, but we want to get to the most commonly asked questions so that we can save librarians time. Great. I, uh, Michelle, I have a two-part question uh, about usage. So how does the usage data get into Intoda, and do you need to upload it, or is there uh, a Z39.50 connection? And then the other part of that is when generating the reports, are you able to do, um, compare several campus usages stats together? So it's a two-parter, sorry. Okay, great questions. So for the first question, usage, libraries are extracting that data from their ILS systems and making it available to us. We are working on how that process will become more automated as we move forward, but right now those are loaded on an FTP site and we grab them and ingest them. And then as far as being able to view statistics from other libraries, I'll pause a minute if Mark has another um, comment on this, but we are not currently making usage statistics from different institutions visible to others. In our peer analysis feature, you are able to see whether or not a peer holds the same title. Okay. Sure, I'll, I'll add to that, uh, Michelle, in that you know, we are already getting requests from uh, some libraries, particularly those that are in a consortia where they may want to limit to their consortia's ad, you know, authentication to be able to see usage library over library. So it's something we're thinking about and you know, we have the data, but it really comes down to what libraries want to share and making sure that we provide the opt-in and opt-out settings so that if you want to show holdings, great but maybe you're not so keen on showing usage and making sure that you have the ability to do that. Or maybe you only want to share with your consortia and your consortia is involved in assessment. We could do that too. So those are things that are in the works. <clears throat> so um, really good questions um, and uh, we are thinking about them. Great, yes, there, we could spend another 10 minutes on questions and I know we are coming up to the hour. So I'm going to hand this back over to Laura and um, so we can wrap up the session, but we will be responding to your questions um, as they've come through the queue. Thank you. Well, it looks like we are ready to wrap up our time together. I'd like to give a virtual round of applause to the panel for sharing some great info with all of us today. We greatly appreciate your time and insights. As a reminder, we have recorded today's program, so please be on the lookout for a follow-up CRL and choice that will include instructions on how to access the archived version. Thanks again to all of our participants for joining us. I hope